never gonna stop the rain by complaining because I'm free. It's an all too familiar sight in a typical British summer. But all that frustration might now be over because an English inventor has come up with this a machine to dry out pitches and greens, whether for cricket, football, bowling, or tennis. And for a change, we haven't had any rain for a few days. So to put it fully to the test, we've enlisted the help of a Hammersmith fire brigade. And they've been emptying about 50 gallons a minute of water onto the grass here. I reckon there must be at least 500 gallons now. That's still no problem for this machine, because it can deal with up to 1,000 gallons an hour. This large sponge roller in the front soaks up the water as it goes along. And as that turns round, it's squeezed against this metal roller here. Rather the same sort of principle as the old-fashioned mangle. The water drops into this tank, and then it's pumped away through a long hose off the pitch where it can't do any damage. And it's very easy to work as well, no more difficult than a motor mower. Oops. If you were trapped in a smoke-filled room, you'd be glad to lay your hands on one of these. It's a new personal gas mask, which the makers say can keep you conscious for up to 15 minutes longer than you might otherwise be. Vital minutes that could mean the difference between life and death. Well, it looks remarkably like the old wartime gas mask, but there's one major difference. In those old ones, the charcoal filter in here acted as just that, a filter to stop poisonous gases like chlorine, phosgene and hydrogen cyanide getting through. But what that filter didn't stop was carbon monoxide. And in most cases where smoke kills, carbon monoxide is the deadly ingredient. Well, the new mask, and we've got the front section of one here, has two filters. And the first is a canister of concertina paper. The second is a canister full of these pellets. That's a mixture of the oxides of copper, cobalt, manganese, and silver. As smoke passes through the paper filter, it removes the solid carbon particles, which gives smoke its black color. Well, that still leaves carbon monoxide. And here, the second filter of chemicals reacts with the gas, changing it from carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, coupled with the oxygen which is still present in smoke, you can breathe. There is great concern in California today that the present generation of schoolchildren might grow up without any understanding of mathematics. From the student's point of view, all they have to do to get by is learn to punch the right buttons on an electronic calculator. And the teachers themselves, who at the elementary grades have to teach every subject, tend to skimp, perhaps, on their commitment to maths because of the availability of so many prepackaged projects and teaching aids on which they can rely. $7. But maths is presenting no problems to these eight-year-olds in East Los Angeles. They're using a device which even its oriental inventors have never thought of trying out in the classroom. $24. $20. The value of counting frames, beads, blocks and the like is that they present a visual representation of the units involved in mathematical computation. But the weakness of such devices is they have limited application. To advance, the student must translate the idea of these counting blocks into a process that he can do in his head before he can move on to a totally different project. However, work being done at the University of Southern California has identified the Japanese abacus as an ideal visual representation of units capable of both basic and advanced mathematical computation. The first day student learns that this top row indicates five units, 
the bottom four indicate individual units. So writing 26 on the abacus is six in the units, two in the tens. Adding 12, one more 10, two more units. The answer, 38. But you can see from the size of this instrument that it's capable of much more. And indeed, even junior students take the idea of this on board very quickly. $22, $152, take away $763. There what? How about loose? 211. Very good. And the abacus can take the students on to much more complicated mathematical concepts. Long multiplication, square roots, logarithms. Boys and girls, will you stop what you're doing now? What's more, the teachers have found that using the abacus gives children much greater confidence to do mental arithmetic. Ready, you want to put your hands down? Concentrate. You see the solar bond in your mind? $52 plus $25. Take away $11 plus $33. Take away $50. Uh, no, that's wrong. 49? That's right. Persevere with the abacus, and it can give you amazing mathematical powers. At the other end of this table is the current United States abacus champion, Oichi Sayano. In between us, the principal of the school, Bruce Matsui, who's got some problems. Koichi is armed with a Japanese abacus. I'm armed with a Japanese calculator. Over to you, Mr. Starter. Gentlemen, are you ready? Yes. Would you add the following? $500,000, Answer, please. 5,770,262. Correct. Yay! I think I got as far as the fifth set of numbers. Koichi, congratulations. Successful defense of your title. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I must leave it to maths teachers and students watching this program in Britain to identify for themselves whether there are similarities between the situation which exists today in California and the position back home. But one thing I can report for certain. There's one group of children in East Los Angeles who are demonstrating that to get the most out of the electronic world of mathematics, it's no bad idea to study, first of all, how the ancients used to do it. No problem. What the Irish Forestry Service is doing here is called taking first thinnings. When these trees were planted some 20 years ago, they were put down close together for their mutual protection. But now, so that they can grow even bigger, they're going to need more space and more light. And every third tree is being sacrificed. Well, chopping them down is no problem. But getting them out of the forest is not so simple. In Britain, after the trees have been sawn down, they're winched out of the rows and cut into lengths. The problem with this is that the expensive chainsaws get damaged by wet mud. But what else can you do? I mean, how could a machine possibly manoeuvre in such a small space over tree trunks and thick mud? case, how could a machine get the logs out? Well, there is something that can, because an inventor living in Ireland has come up with this. And with it, one man can shift up to 50 tonnes a day, much more than my other methods. And it can travel just about anywhere.
It's basically a tractor with the front wheels removed, joined to the back half of another tractor. A drive shaft on a universal joint gives four-wheel drive, but allows the front and back wheels to work independently. Driving it, however, takes a bit of practice. H-A-O-B. Does it improve if I twist that lens a little bit? No, no, that's making it, making it worse. Better like yeah. that. Okay. It's actually taken half an hour for Jeremy to do the full eye test and to find the right combination of lenses for Michael to be able to read all the test card. And if he'd been testing a young child or a foreigner, it would take at least twice that time because the whole business depends on the patient responding correctly. So it's all very subjective. Perhaps inevitably, machines like this one are taking over. And this is one type we're going to see at our opticians in the very near future. It combines computers with optics to make an initial diagnosis for the optician to work on. And it does its job not only more quickly at 20 seconds an eye, but also without the patient having to speak at all. So if we could have our patient, you are allowed to speak to I think. Are you, are you qualified to do that? Oh no, the machine does everything. So could you just look in at that end? Yeah. And then an operator at the other end adjusts the machine so that Michael's pupil is in the centre of the screen. Then, inside the machine, a safe infrared light is focused on Michael's retina at the back of the eye. A detector picks up the light beam as it bounces back from the retina. And if the image it receives is sharp, then the eye is normal. But if the image is blurred, there's something wrong with the eye and a computer-controlled lens is moved to and fro in the beam of light until the image becomes sharp. Measurements are done at many different angles. Each one takes only two seconds, so that a complete picture of the eye's visual problems can be built up. The difference between the first reading, when the image is blurred, and the second reading, when the lens has moved to sharpen the image, is worked out by a computer inside this machine. And it produces a printout, like this, of Michael's eye. But the real test, obviously, for the machine is if it's accurate, accurate as the old method. So, Jeremy, what results did you get with your traditional 30 minute test? Well, I found the sill to be minus one diopter. Cylinder minus one, yes, that's what I get on here. And the axis 105 degrees. It's 102 on here, so very, very close. And the left eye was cylinder minus one diopter and the axis 80 degrees we have here minus one and 72. So it really is very close, remarkably close. Don't you worry that it's going to do you out of business? I know a lot of opticians are worried about these machines. Not at all, because although the results are comparable, nevertheless, the results have to be checked and uh, modified to suit the patient's individual requirements. You still need the expert. And because it will save about 10 minutes a patient, it obviously must be good news. Correct. Thank you very much. Most diving nowadays doesn't need a heavy, cumbersome suit. A small amount of equipment can take you safely to depths of 165 feet or more. And it can cope with most of the hazards you're likely to meet. Normal diving equipment consists of an air cylinder filled with compressed air, tubes running from that to a mouthpiece, lead weights to make sure that you sink properly, and of course, a mask and some flippers. Now, usually, if you want to come up to the surface, you have to kick like mad with your flippers. But in an emergency, you can't just drop your leg weights, or you could use one of these. It's a diving life jacket. And at the back here, there's a little bottle of compressed air. All you have to do is turn the handle. But using one of these, or even dropping lead weights, means that you've got very little control over your rate of ascent. And particularly in an emergency situation, the tendency is to come up too fast. It's the last 30 feet that are the real danger. Coming up at speed means the air in the diver's lungs expands too fast, and that could be fatal. On BBC One in about five minutes, taxi further goings on at the Sunshine Cab Company. 
On BBC Two, the world about us pays tribute to some very gallant gentlemen and celebrates 150 years of exploration with the Royal Geographical Society.